Well, hey, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Innovation Tech Talks brought to you by Omron, a leader in healthcare technology. I'm your host, Corey Knowles, the managing editor of Innovation Tech Today. And today's podcast is going to be a neat blend of tech and its impact on current events. Our guest today is Colonel John Spencer. He serves as the chair of urban warfare at the Modern War Institute at West Point. He's also the host of the Urban Warfare Project podcast and the author of Connected Soldiers, Life, Leadership, and Social Connections in Modern War. Colonel Spencer, how are you doing today? Uh, I'm amazing, and I'm really honored to be on the show. Awesome. Well, we're we're super honored to have you here. When the, the deal came through, I was like, oh, this is so perfect. Uh, tell me a little... Uh, and the readers a little about what you do with West Point, if you would. Sure. So I'm the chair of urban warfare studies for the Modern War Institute, which is a, a research center at the United States Military Academy. Uh, so I, I'm actually not there. I live in Colorado. But I, for the last, really when I retired from the military in 2018, I stayed working for them. And I all I do is study urban warfare. And then I write articles and reports and I have a podcast show that then for, for West Point, that enriches their curriculum and teaching, you know, future leaders of our army. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's, that's neat. Sounds like a, a busy world. I read a couple of your articles yesterday as well on the, that were up on the Modern War Institute site. Wow. Thanks. Great stuff. Thanks a Really lot. is it? It looks like you publish a lot. <laughs> it, it, I have a dream job is what I tell everybody. It really, it is. It's, it's about as close as a self-actualization, I think, as I could get. Well, Let's talk a little about Connected Soldiers. Tell us how the idea for the book came about, if you don't mind. Sure. So it really came about when I was at West Point writing a lot, and I wrote an article that, you know, it's almost like hitting the lottery that the New York Times picked up. Um, and it was... Oh, yeah. I, you never get to choose the titles, so, but the, the New York Times op-ed was a band of tweeters, or uh, that was really one... There were two titles, but um, it was a short article really highlighting the issue that I had seen in, in my second combat deployment where, you know, the world changes and so does the militaries. And they were all my soldiers and myself, to be frank, and this isn't one like the old guy going, oh, everything's changing. It was uh, all my soldiers were connected through technology back to their families and home. And really in war, that's that's different. So I highlighted in the article how there's some drawbacks to that that some people – might not think about um, about cohesion and things, but it also there's there's lots of positives, of course, from the you know the soldier being able to talk to his family, his who he loves. You know, I'm a father of three, um, and that's in the book actually. That I I was on the other end when my wife deployed later, and I had three <laughs> small kids. But the op-ed, uh, the article, which was 2015, actually, um, it did really well, and really the the outreach from everybody around the world, to be honest, was writing me saying. I 100% agree with you. I'm, I'm on a submarine in the middle of blah, blah, blah. And, and it's and we see it here where um, technology has has amazing benefits. But there, there are some hidden cautions about constant connectivity around the world. Yeah, I'm sure there are. I want to talk about mo that more in just a minute. Sure. I imagine with your, with your background right now, it, you're watching the – Russian invasion of Ukraine rather closely. And I can't help but wonder, are you more or less concerned than the rest of us? I mean, all war is terrible. Uh, only, I, I think only the dead have seen the end of war. Um, I think yeah. as an old soldier and, you know, basically being able to draw the lines of, okay, really what people are thinking is really bad is, is more normal. Um, and then there's some things that are extremely concerning that I, as a guy who's been in, sometimes people think that I'm over concerned with like war crimes and genocide and things like that. But yeah, that, that really touches me. And one of the reasons it touches me is because I, I saw photos of some of the stuff that we've seen recently before it hit national news. Yeah. Because stuff of stuff out of Buka and such. Yeah. yeah. yeah exactly. The, 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 the executions, the, the, yeah. the mutilation of bodies, all of that. I was seeing photos of that through online forums before it hit the news. So really well, see, that's me. the way we were. We were watching it on, you know, Nimico on YouTube or something and, yep. and keeping up with these various maps and things. I said, you could track everything now, just about it's, it's kind of crazy. 
Yeah, we call that open source intelligence. Um, and I've seen in wars, even the U.S. like involvement in Iraq and things, the open source is now a part of what we do um, because mm-hmm. it's so immediate. Like I can watch a live camera in, in Kiev this whole time. Uh, where yep. the, you know, the capital, I could watch live feeds. That, that is different. So your know, technology is really, of course, changing the world. That's changing war as well. Yeah. What would you say, uh, I guess, as we're discussing urban warfare, what are some of the challenges you face in urban warfare compared to what we've seen in the past in jungles, deserts, and beaches and such? What's, what's different in an urban environment? Sure. So it's really, I mean, everything. Um, so I, I'm a, you know, I've had the the dream job to study it, uh, not yeah. only from personal experiences. So I don't, I don't always like talking about my own. Here's how hard it was for me, but historically, there, there is some. They call the urban train the great equalizer. So it, it used to be written in our books, the, the military books, to avoid and bypass whenever you can. Like just don't, don't go in. Just don't. Um, <laughs> just don't. Uh, and, and the reason for that, the one we can talk a little bit later about why that's. It's unavoidable. And Ukraine is really just highlighting that. But Mm -hmm. the reasons that militaries either do or don't. So if you're Russians, you want to avoid urban at all costs because it's called the great equalizer. Um, You know, militaries, modern militaries are, you know, they can see with satellites into, if you're standing out in the open, you're basically dead. Um, I can, I have, I have all amazing weapons that can, hit you as far away as I could possibly, I can literally be sit, and we've seen this, right? I could be sitting in Russia and I can launch a missile and, and I don't have to get close to you at all. We don't yeah. like getting close to our, our enemies. Yeah. When the urban train, it, most of those advanced military capabilities are reduced. You can't see through concrete. You can't see into some of the dense urban areas. Um, you can't hit things. Like if you want to bomb, but you, you're not sure. It's easy to hide in urban terrain. And one of you knows the terrain better than others. That's right. Um, and if you prepare, so the defense, so it, you just highlight like, so if you're in the urban terrain already, right? So if it's a race and I get inside the urban, it's an immediate defense, right? Usually if you're in a jungle or in the woods, you have to spend months and years to prepare it for fighting. Yeah. I can run into any city and, and turn a building into a literally a battle uh, because concrete with, with rebar and reinforcement is a very strong natural fortification so if mm-hmm. i can get in there and like you said like i know the train and there's a you know you think just walk into any city and, and look around and how scary that would be to think that there's a weapon in any window um militaries just don't like to do it and then oh by the way the, the urban areas have people in them and most people yeah. russia showing that they don't follow the law of war uh so whenever you enter into urban areas usually the military's ability to use force, you know, whether it's bombs or whatever is reduced because we follow the laws of war and there's the law of the war is really to protect civilians. I mean, Mm -hmm. it's also about the rules on what you'll, what you can and can't do to each other, but it's really about protecting after, especially after world war II, protecting our, our populations that are not combatants are not party. You're not a party of the conflict. So there's all these rules on what we can and can't do in urban areas, specifically we call it protected people or populations and protected sites, right? I can't shoot at hospitals and schools and things like that uh, unless they're being used yeah. for military purposes. So, right, just it makes sense, right? So if I'm a military, I, why would I want to go into urban terrain when it, I, 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 as soon as I go in, even if I'm more powerful and better, my stuff don't work, doesn't work the same. He could be anywhere. I don't know where he is. Uh, and then I can't use the full amount of my capabilities because I have to protect everything around me. Wow. That's so different. And I guess in the situation we're in now, if someone you're fighting against decides that we don't care about those rules, uh, there's nothing you can do about it really at the time, is there? Well, so yes and no, right? So if they're not following the laws of war, um, we have established lots of mechanisms in order to address that. Um, But so the other thing I didn't talk about, and this is really strongly just based on technology, right? Like we were just talking about, I, anybody can watch what's going on there, right? I, yeah. We saw the war crimes before it. Um, in, in wars, we, we say there's three, um, it's called the Trinity. There's the military, there's the politics, all wars, politics, and then there's the people. And when you're fighting a war, you have to care about all three of those, right? So Russia does have yeah. to care about its population, and it has to care about the international community. 
So when you fight on a war today, like it makes sense, right? There's a million, there's more cell phones in most places than there are people. Yeah. Uh, there, you know, the cameras, this, the, the satellites, you can't hide what you're doing in war. And then you really can't in urban areas, right? We, we've seen from day one, like uploads of like Russian vehicles driving in. Like all of us got to watch that. That's actually different too. So that's really like having a war in a football stadium and having everybody yeah. watch your every move. So even if you're not following the laws of war, if you go into urban areas, uh, you know, your ability to hide what you're doing, right? So if you do, it, yeah. in, in this scenario, we're seeing, right, based on the actions of Russia, um, in, in, if we can verify that it's that it's real, because there is this whole thing about deep fakes and all that things, if we can verify what, what we're all watching, as in we the world, then that in, either drives us to do something about it, like send something more to Ukrainians, to that side of the fight, or do something else to Russia in our own way, because we can't fight for Ukraine. But in, that's a part of urban warfare, the fact that we all can watch. And it, it influences yeah. all the populations, right? There's protests going on in Russia now because they're watching, although they're really trying to control the information. But you probably know it's really hard to do that today. It's 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 hard and it's getting harder, I imagine. That's right. Oh, yeah. I mean, we all saw Elon Musk um, give them a, a satellite uplink because they asked yeah. for it, right? Like, here, we'll just give you these. Of course, he also offered to fist fight him. He did. So, <laughs> well, hey, we're going to take a quick break here for a short message from our sponsors at Omron. Today's episode of Innovation Tech Talks is brought to you by Omron. Omron is a world leader in technology designed to solve social issues, improve lives, and build a better tomorrow. They serve a range of industries which utilize their technologies to innovate and grow factory automation, healthcare, mobility, and energy management. In the industrial automation business, Omron Technology demonstrates the power of machines to unleash human potential, pursuing the ideal in automation, in which people and machines are working together in harmony. Omron provides sensing, control, safety, vision, motion, and robotics technologies for the automotive, food and beverage packaging, semiconductor, electronics, life sciences, and infrastructure industries. For over 80 years, Omron has helped industrial businesses maximize potential by solving problems with creativity. Learn more, go to automation.omron.com. You know, we were just talking about how you can watch all of this live on television now. Uh, And I have. Uh, It's weird that I remember watching Desert Storm on a on a small dial color television and thinking that was the craziest thing ever, that we were watching these anti-aircraft missiles and stuff flying over Baghdad. Uh, how does that level of connectivity and visibility affect decision-making in modern war? Yeah. Uh, So you make a good point, right? So this aspect of being able to watch the war has been around for a while, whether you even talk photographs. Um, Yeah. But there is a a quantity and an immediacy to today, like we were just talking about. Um, It absolutely um, affects decision-making of both sides and what they're planning to do. And they factor, we call it information operations um, in, in factoring out. Okay. We're getting ready to do this, but you know, based on what, what we think will be sh- either shown or, or telegraphed to the other person, it, it all matters. And one of the real good examples I like to use, uh, I don't know if you remember the first battle of Fallujah, there were four American you know, citizens that were killed in this, in the city in Iraq called Fallujah. Mm-hmm. Um, I had a couple the, friends there. Yeah. Um, the videos, which were heartbreaking, of our citizens being drugged through the streets and then hung up on a, a bridge motivated the entire U.S. population to, I want immediate action. And that's mm-hmm. what we call, you know, militaries don't do what they want. Militaries follow political leaders and they, they get their objectives from the political leaders. So at the time, our political leaders said the military needed to respond and respond immediately. So that was like one end of it, right? So what the enemy did influenced us t- to tell our military to do something. So it clearly <laughs> it affected the decision making. On the other aspect of it, so we us the US military executed the mission that we were given and because there was media inside the city, um there was actually some uh, Al Jazeera cameramen and, and reporters inside the hospital of this really war that a battle that had started over a single city because yeah. of the U S population, right? Politics and po- population. 
Um, well, that battle had to end in four days before they even got really got started as they were pushing into the city to really um, achieve some type of stability was one of their objectives in this really rogue city that had done this. Uh, it, of course, it's not all the people in the city. They had very specific people they were going to get. And they had to yeah. stop because because of the images that were coming out of the, the live footage and the images of the civilian casualties that is, is no matter how much you try, there's always going to be civilian casualties in urban warfare. Um, yeah. it, it stopped the military. So it, wow. they had to immediately pull out because the whole political net framework, which we were helping build, was falling apart. Um, mm-hmm. In the Iraqi politics, right? This is, this is their country said, hey, stop. I don't care what you're doing. Just stop. And it stopped. Yeah. So that's a really good example of how it can affect decision making and actions on the ground. Wow. It's interesting to see that, you know, uh, is that effect the same whether, you know, I know there's, there's more information out there regarding what you see. You see, you can go on Twitter and there are Ukrainian citizens, there are soldiers, there are agencies that are sharing out images and video. How do you sift through that and determine what's good and, and regulate that among soldiers somehow. I, I just can't imagine how you can have any kind of a grasp on that information flow out of a war zone. Yeah, it's, it is very complex. So even I have my own ways of doing it and I study this for a living. Uh, who do I trust as a, 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 an immediate news source? And a lot of it's really not the major media. I mean, I, I do a lot of media appearances trying to help provide my analysis of what, what I'm seeing. Um, but you're right. Yeah. I, th- there's a thing called a, these Twitter forums that were, I've never seen before, where it's, it's just literally an online chat room for 24 hours a day. And it's got a thousand people in it most of the time. Everything yeah. from a, a Ukrainian citizen in a besieged city to like political leaders. I mean, it's just crazy. Um, but you know, for the soldiers, it's, you know, it's, usually they're getting information ironically from their families. And that's really part of my book, right? Connected Soldiers is the, the days of the soldier going off to fight. It doesn't matter if you're Russia or Ukraine or United States. The days of soldiers going off to fight a war and then you know they'll, they'll write a letter home talking about what they're seeing and they'll get letters. That Those days are gone. To, and it was friends. and it was a month to get it. It was a month to send it. it exactly. It, you know, now it's I mean, I guess it's great to be able to at the end of the night still say good night to your wife and kids. Uh, that would right. be the wonderful that, side of this. Yeah. And that actually is a double edged sword, too. Right. So I, that's so my book can, it's, it's, it really shows three periods. 2003, when I did an invasion into Iraq, and it was kind of like the Band of Brothers movie, like really us all going off the war. We'd write notes on cardboard, like postcards, and send them home and be really excited when we got something back. You know, by the time I went back in 20, 2008, you could come off of a, a scene, you know, dead people and come back and just immediately talk, talk to your, your kids and your wife. Um, and, and they can immediately tell you about their day, which then influences your actions. That's so then in 2018, true. my wife went off the war. And I'm at home with my kids who literally could FaceTime her, just like you said, every night. And there are huge benefits for that. And then there were, there were actually, there were drawbacks. Um, it's, I don't think there's any, there's no going back, right? I've actually seen stories of basically all the soldiers' phones being taken from them uh, and their in the laptops. Like, look, uh, no matter what, people find a way. Uh, yeah. And that's what we're well, seeing in, in, in Russia, in Ukraine, actually, like a Russian soldiers that get captured, the first thing the Ukrainians give them on top of water is a cell phone to call home. Oh, wow. That's wild. Because every soldier, right? So this is kind of why I've been, you know, I, what I talk about Ukraine is not just about urban warfare. It's about what it takes to fight. And we know that you need the, the inside of you, you need to have a cause, you need to have motivation. A lot of people just call it morale. Um, mm-hmm. But the, the, each individual is a comp, just like you. You I mean you have friends that you love and loved ones, and even if you were to join a, in the military, you'd love your friends, and that's why yeah. soldiers actually will, are willing to die for each other is because they love each other. Um, but there, it's a really complex. You, you are a complex individual, so when you you have these external support networks, they're very important to you, and now they're they're with you in war. That's interesting. I guess also then the problem with that would be 
your home headaches come too, you know, That's worrying right. about exactly. rent, worrying about those kind of things, then yeah, drag with the, you. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what I talk about in the book, right? So yes, there are positives, right? Because being in the military and having a family is hard, to be honest. You're, you're gone a lot. And there are a lot of professions that's like that, right? Um, one of the vivid moments that really, you know, I couldn't finish this book without having gone through that experience of me being the person home. Uh, for Christmas, my wife wanted to, you know, she wanted to be a part of everything, even while she was gone. <laughs> so for Christmas, she made me put a, an iPad on a chair and she woke up at like two in the morning, right? To be there at the right time, whatever time it was and where she was. So she could watch the kids open up every present. So there's this weird futuristic, you know, chair with mom's face on it. And each kid would walk up and go, Santa brought me this. An uh, iPad taped to a broom or something. Yeah. yeah it was just <laughs> sitting in a chair, like the Jetsons kind of stuff. Um, yeah. And it was, didn't feel right, to be honest. It, it was okay. crushing. Uh, and, you know, I don't over exaggerate in the book her reaction, but she cried after hanging up that phone because there, you know, there is a part of being in war and being able to compartmentalize how it, it all, it always sucks. Anytime you leave, um, there's that homesickness and all that stuff. But if it's immediate in your face and you're missing this moment that is yeah. developmental, it, it uh, really hurt her. Suddenly you're depressed today when you otherwise would exactly. have maybe been working through things. Yeah. Yep. Or been focused on the mission, right? You got yeah. as a leader that that's, I mean, you got, that's what I, I struggled with in 2008. You know, a guy gets a message that his pregnant wife is drug, had a drug overdose. Like I can't take this guy on the mission with me. He's, he's, he's a hot mess and he should be. Yeah. Uh, so that, that, those connections are both amazingly great. Uh, and they can also be really detrimental. I'll bet they can. In chapter nine of your book, Get the Internet Back Up, you talked a little about some of the pitfalls early on of of kind of ineffective leadership and stepping into these roles. And and I was wondering how has leadership changed in today's landscape? Because I mean, I assume there's there's an entirely different approach now to that kind of stuff. I mean, are, are soldiers told, you know, yes, you can do this. You need to be careful with this. And here, here are the potential drawbacks. So you're aware ahead of time. Yes. So it, it, it adds another layer to le our leadership, right? So, and that's really one of the motivations of the book is one, I give more questions than I do answers, but you know, I struggled with this as a leader. Like you said, my unit had just been literally destroyed and a catastrophic setback. Uh, it, it was a, you know, nine, almost 200 pound bombs going off on top of them. Uh, the ones in the back of the truck. Yeah. The, the, yeah. The that was I a crazy ran. story. Yeah. And it was, there's a video of actually that attack because the enemy taped it and you can go on YouTube to this day and watch it. Uh, wow. And it, it, it's amazing that they all didn't die. But oh um, as a leader, I had to know, right. One, there's a natural inclination of just wanting to turn it off. Right. Just say, yeah. But that, that's not reality. Although I did find it really surprising that that was the number one priority I, of my leaders to get that connection to their home back up. Like, I, like, look, I need to get security back up. I need us to protect ourselves and things like that. But they're like, no, get the internet up because we Give think me the internet. That, yeah, <laughs> we think that you know, feeling good or the motivation in the morale of the soldier is, is we know it's important, right? Yeah. Um. So yes, the leader has to now have an awareness that that's you can't control that. Yeah. But leadership for us is also about knowing the soldiers. Mm -hmm. So all the way down to the individual sergeant that's in charge of, you know, four guys, part of our leadership system, which isn't like others, like the Russians, is that he, he knows each soldier intimately, right? Yeah. So we're not going to, you know, listen into his phone call with his wife. Yeah. But if the soldier has what's called cohesion, as in that, that small group is like a family. Um, and this is what I talk about in the book, like that can't go away. That yeah. you're that you have these families, even though you had this open line to you a real family. Um, although we call our military family, a, you know, a brotherhood, a sisterhood, it's a real family to us. Yeah. Um, if you don't share, if they're not sharing with each other, like from mindless hours, and we call it, you know, war is like this long hours of boredom punctuated with extreme fear, uh, because you do sit around a lot, and that's where you would talk about. So if if he got, you know off the phone and there's something really bad going wrong and his immediate family doesn't know about that or they're not talking through it, then that's where as in leaders, we should be involved in 
you know, checking and, and making sure those connections and those families within the military continue to develop. It's called cohesion or the primary group cohesion. Uh-huh. It's the single factor that we have known through, for re- through literally from longitudinal research in multiple armies and multiple wars. The number one factor that matters um, the most is that they have cohesion within each other because that's why he'll, he's willing to die and do great things for each other. So if you it's allow, as much about fighting for one another as it is about fighting for your country. It's more than it, yeah. I mean, yeah. why people join the military is comp, you know that's a long list. Yeah. Why they stay in the military another long list, right? But why they are willing to fight and die for each other is is a very small list because that's the research that was done. Really, it's called it's a lot of research is called why why soldiers fight. Um, and there's a real you know the most decorated soldier in the U.S. history. Uh, his name was Audie Murphy. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a real good story of him basically attacking a German company of armored vehicles by himself um, from a burning tank. Uh, and, and they made a movie about it, right? To hell him back. Uh, and the, they asked him why he did that. One guy, almost a suicidal charge against a company, over 50 Germans. And he says, because they were killing my friends. Yeah. What, what's your option? You know, that's wow. That's quite a story. Yeah, it's an amazing story. And it's an amazing highlight of, because there is an option, right? There is research on showing that if soldiers don't have cohesion, then they, they might not shoot their weapon. Uh, they might not move forward and they may do things like shoot themselves in the foot. Uh, Just to know, get off the battlefield. <laughs> that's right, to get off the battlefield, right? If you don't if you don't love somebody, like why, why do I need to stay here? I'll find any way I can to get out. And really that's what why, again, Ukraine, it highlights what we've known for centuries. Is that you? You can, you can, yes, you can force soldiers to fight, and they, they are fighting. Like you said, you can instill that that rallying call for the nation and for each other. But when it comes down to it, especially when it gets really bad, he has to be fighting to the person to the left and right and his leaders. Yeah. So you you see, there's been reports of Russian soldiers running over their leaders with tanks, or you know, yeah, that's, there's been some crazy stuff out of that. Yeah, but if you look at like Vietnam and there's been there's wars where that happens when you lose. Um, when you start to lose things like cohesion, uh, when they don't they don't like their leaders or they don't trust their leaders, or leadership is not about telling people what to do; it's actually inspiring them to follow you. Yeah, and the Russians don't get that either. Yeah, that's true. It's a it's been really interesting, you know. Watching this, I've I've always had this giant Mother Russia image in my head of what it would look like, and and it's it's. It's almost sad. <laughs> just, well, not sad, but it, it's just not at all what I expected I, to see from them. Not the equipment, the people, the way they're geared. I tell Nothing you the, about it is what we thought. Yeah. I tell you, as a military analyst, no, even us, it, the world is surprised. We all thought Russia had rebuilt itself into some big, super, not a superpower, but this big, it was, it was listed as the second largest military that, it was listed as the second best. It's now yeah. like, you know, if we're going to rank and, and you know, rank order, it's like down, way down the list now. Like, yeah. Like number 50 or something like that. I was going to say, yeah, you're down dozens <laughs> Yeah, at this point. From every, well, you know, every way. Oh, sorry, go ahead. From every level, from the sol- your ability to motivate soldiers to your ability to do basic military stuff. Yeah. Wow. Well, you know, while, while the world now presents – this unique set of challenges and we think back to 20 years ago and how different that was from today. What do you do in relation to thinking about the next 20 years? I mean, how, how can you imagine how much more interconnected this could be a couple decades into the future from here? Yeah. I mean, this is where I get, you know, I I think I have job security for a long time because there's, there's not many people that focus on urban warfare. Again, yeah. because militaries want to avoid it. But mm-hmm. as Ukraine has shown, um, there's no there's no road that doesn't lead to urban. Like, yeah. you, if you're trying to get somewhere in a war, you're going to pass through urban. Let alone yeah. the fact that urban areas strategically have always been the objective. You know, we, we, what we say is you've either been fighting for a city, like a capital city, or you've been fighting in a city. Yeah. And what Russia reminds the world is that also that... We have this over fixation about the future of war with you know AI, robotics, you know, advanced weaponry and all this stuff. 
but you still got to, if depending on who you are, you either have to, you still, you can bomb all you want, but you still got to cross into somebody else's, even if it's enemy territory and take what they value their yeah. populations in their, in their cities. Now, if you're the other end of that, which I think for the last 20 ish years, we kind of not, I don't say we've forgotten, but like Ukraine didn't have to go fight anybody. It needed to protect its land, right? Because Russia yeah. wanted to take it. So in order to achieve a win, which that's really hard for us uh, to say, mm-hmm. what does winning look like? What is victory? Yeah. Um, but for this war, it's really easy to see. Well, the number one goal is to keep them from taking my land in my mm-hmm. capital city in, the, in my political leadership. So going into the future, that doesn't change. We have these things called the uh, the enduring nature of war, the fact that it's it's human, right? I, I don't think you're ever going to see a war where you know the Terminator versus the Terminator, and we're just going to sit back and let our robots fight it out. Um, yeah. Because the future of war, or the, pre- the war today is urban, and Ukraine's showing that, and war in the future is urban, going to be urban. I, mean, I don't want to take too many lessons from a bad army like Russia and say, you know, the f- these are the capabilities that we all need and things like that. That's always really a, a slippery slope. But the world is urban, right? 180,000 yeah. people move to a city a day. Wow. Yeah. So, that's so where, many. yeah, where are you going to fight that's not urban today? There are a few places you could you could do it, but there you're not going to get to that location without going through something. Like like a big giant city, uh, yeah. You know, where you're you're gonna ex- pass through one eventually. Yeah. yeah. So the future. So for me, twenty years from now, I can say with strong confidence that the future is urban. Wow. Has this uh, has this shift in dynamics all around led to the military recruiting more and more STEM slash keyboard warriors than just your prototypical i guess the jock guy you would think of is this kind of changed what the military is after absolutely yeah so um you still need you, you still need it all right and in the u.s yeah. military is a little different right so we will we recruit from the best and then we'll develop them into the best but we there also have um we have thousands of jobs and many of them are very technological right so we stood mm-hmm. up like I know the software unit um, that all they do is code uh, and, and develop software for the U.S. Army because that is you know you cannot get over the that is the future right binary code and, and, and software and the hardware yeah so absolutely they recruit um, technologically uh, I don't know what the right word is but you know basically people that are that's their their gift and their passion. So the, the army is really big about matching not only what we need, but the talent to the to the job requirements. Uh, even my wow. wife, who who's in the army, some people ask me like, does playing video games help help you basically? You know, I'm really hesitant to say that, right? So I, if everybody could play Call of Duty and become a Delta Force operator, then we wouldn't really need the military, right? Uh, <laughs> that's so right. That, that's not true. Uh, but there are skills that you learn, even in playing video games. And my wife's a bomb disposal. And she oh, says wow. that, and there's lots of caveats to that, but people that are that just have what we call spatial projection skills and, and very technologically savvy are really good at driving the robot, which is a, you know, you don't approach, nobody approaches a bomb by themselves um, unless they have to. So they usually they send a robot for it. I call it Johnny Five. My wife doesn't like that. Um, but they drive <laughs> the robot, right? Uh, yeah. And the same thing with drones, right? Drones are the future. Yeah. And it ta- some people can just pick up flying, flying a drone and some people are just naturals at it. Uh, yeah. So the answer is absolutely. But the Army is really good about, okay, we see an increase in, in need for technologically savvy. And then yeah. there's all these different routes. And yes, even some of the physical standards. You know, we, want, we have a baseline requirement for all of them, but yeah. you know, it isn't the same, right? Like I'm an infantryman. I still need... That hasn't changed, and I don't think it's going to yeah. change. You need to put a heavy thing on your back and be able to walk with it f- for a long time. Yeah, and you need that upper body strength. You need that stamina and agility. Uh, where I guess that would be a difference in what you would need when you need a coder. Yeah, for well, example. 
Well, what I say about that, and I'm pretty passionate about that, right? Um, uh -huh. We know that f fitness directly correlates to mental fitness. So yes. uh, there are, I mean, it's, it's not, it's not my, my opinion. We know, and one of the reasons that the military does exercise so much, people think it's just because of you. It is directly related to combat, but it's also about mental health. Yeah. It's also about bone density. And it's also about you know, preventing disease. Uh, mm -hmm. so I was, I joined the army at 17 and I was re-raised on just how to eat right. And, and, the the, basically the psychological benefits of exercising every day and all that. So I'm just real caveat to you. Yeah, of course we need coders, but there's lots of benefits for a coder to go out and do some exercise because it's yeah, it actually for sure. <laughs> translates to mental. That's uh, right. You know. Wow. Well, just one more question then I'll let sure. you go. Uh, uh there's. So with all this information out there, how does the military wade through all of the mess to find that genuine intel? And and is the U.S. public more susceptible to the disinformation we see than you think other countries would be? Yeah, that's a great question. I I would say yes. And one of the reasons is because we're we believe in a free press. Mm -hmm. And there's no, and there's nothing, and I, this is what, you know, I study this in school, but I also believe it. Um, there's no such thing as sub objective news. There's, there's yeah. always some subjectivity to it. There's, there, there, yeah. Yeah. There's an angle. It's all for money. It's, it, and, and because we don't have free press, although we have PBS and that's great. And I love it. Yeah. Um, there's a, there's, there's a part of this. One of the reasons we're susceptible to disinformation is just because of the, the leanings of all the different organizations that are part of our free press that will come with an agenda. So I'd say yes, just because we're so free that then everything's available. And then some people will go down, you know, conspiracy theories and, and different tracks because of we, we're, we're so free. And that's the benefit of, of our, the power of our nation. Uh, how does the military do it is, is extremely complex, but like you said, they recruit, develop in, and employ the best in the world as in our, our population, right? Our brain trust. Um, yeah. And there's lots of people that believe in, in everything that we stand for and, and do that service. And then there's, you know, we also invest in this, right? So we invest in organizations like the, in the national security agency and all these people that can help identify bots and mm -hmm. disinformation campaigns and Russians trying to influence our elections. And you really fight, you fight different information with facts. To be I bet clear. that's a job for thousands of people to it wade is. through all of too. It is. <laughs> it is. And, I, and sometimes you steer off course, right? I mean, yeah. we have seen that in history that where your power begets power and some people steer off course. Um, yeah. And then that's why we have the beauty of our system too is that we have so many checks and balances to ensure that that doesn't happen. Uh I don't know if our founders knew what they were doing, but we got it really right on not letting power shift to one organization to where you'd see abuse of all that. But yeah. there's always, you know, of course, there's plenty of times in history. And, and as, like you said, as we have to do this more, uh, the regulation needs you know, is there. And that's why we hire, I mean, that's why we elect our leaders to ensure they have oversight. Even if we don't know about it, I know yeah. from it, that there are groups that are specifically just oversight to make sure that we're not, doing things like, you know, um, listening into U S populations just because we want to, right. So just because you want to. Yeah. Right. yeah. Cause you can, uh, yeah. but we have, you know, I mean, just crazy. Like, like you said, we have thousands of people doing that. And then we have thousands of people that are involved in just the oversight of those thousands doing it. <laughs> it's wild how big it's gotten. Yeah. Well, well, Colonel Spencer, uh, where can our listeners find your book and keep up with what you've got going with your podcast and everything? Thank, so my book's available on Amazon today. Uh, it's called Connected Soldiers, Life, Leadership, and Social Connections in Modern War. Um, you can find me on almost every social media platform. I'm really uh, on Twitter called Spencer Guard. My mm -hmm. podcast is called the Urban Warfare Project Podcast. It's available on iTunes, Stitcher, you know, all the normal stuff. All the usual places. Yeah. Awesome. 
Well, I really appreciate you taking time out of your day to join us and have this conversation. It's been a lot of fun and really interesting. Thanks a lot, Corey. All right. Make sure to follow Innovation Tech Talks on Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, YouTube, and all of the many places you go. We're about everywhere. Grab a copy of Innovation in Tech today, next time you're wherever you buy magazines. And that's it for this week. We'll catch you back here next time. Thanks for watching.